Before I tell you the important things about her, before I tell you, I mean, I, I'll tell you this. She was born in the perfect year, which is 1943. No offense, Norman. <laughs> She, was, uh, she went to the perfect college, which is Smith. She acquired uh, an MFA from Fairleigh Dickinson College. She lived in Greece. She speaks some sort of Greek, not frequently, but well. She's married to my Uncle Fred, who has risen from being president of the Michigan Bar to become an avid archaeological researcher in Roman forts and, I don't know, stuff that sounds religious to me, but which she says is not. She, they now live in uh, D.C., where they try to ignore politics, and also in western North Carolina, where they try to ignore politics. <laughs> She's past president and current vice chair of the Folger Shakespeare Library Board. I don't know what they have to do with vice, but it sounds good. <laughs> and she sings completely on key, even after having been born in 1943, in the premier chorus of Washington, D.C., the city choir, and three other choruses besides. But before I tell you all that, I want you to know the important things about her. After a poem entitled, after she wrote a poem entitled Taps and won thereby a major prize, uh, she took up the trumpet in order to be worthy of the poem. This, what, 60 years after your birth, perhaps? Something like that. Um, this is my favorite story about her. She, she is a fabricator as all poets are, all writers are. And she started early to practice fabrication. She discovered as a child that she was the only girl, the only child in her family of five children who hadn't been given a middle name. So she made her own up. And her middle name, the middle name she made up, was Withany. And that is because her name is spelled A-N-N-E. And she got tired of saying, it's Anne with an E. So she called herself Anne with an E Harding, <laughs> signed things Anne W. Harding right up to college, maybe even into college. But this is the kind of imagination that produces the poet you're going to hear tonight. She can tell you any number of odd facts like the name of the last passenger pigeon that who was alive before the whole species went extinct. Mm -hmm. The name of that pigeon, I know because I read her poem, is Martha, by the way, in case someone asks you on the way out. Um, she, she will offer to take you on a walk in Washington, D.C., which has as you may imagine, several perfectly serviceable sidewalks. But Anne's idea of a walk in Washington, D.C. is to find the only forest there and the only mountains and to take you clambering up and down to and from Rock Creek, clinging to root systems and going heel to toe on two-inch paths above the abyss. She has, before... I know this because I just visited with her. Before you rise at a perfectly respectable hour, she needs only five hours of sleep a night, one of those people. She has, before you rise, whipped up and refrigerated a little lunch for eight, uh, done two Washington Post crossword puzzles, restored and upholstered upholstered two small pieces of furniture. <laughs> and dashed off the first draft of a poem. Fred, my uncle Fred, her husband, has uh, declared in my hearing that she has something called TPD, which is low productivity disorder. <laughs> and to that, uh, to prove that, I can tell you that she has written 
five full-length books, starting in 1978 with Guide to Greece and Back. The second one called The Mushroom Papers. She likes bizarre. She, she likes to produce information and metaphor on what is bizarre. Um, Spare Parts, a novella in verse from which she read here, what, five years ago? Yeah, seven years ago. Sorry, it's been so long. Anyway, that was about race cars in, in North Carolina. She knows about, she knows about engines. Um, the Artemis Sonnets, from which she's going to read tonight, and which is uh, a, a series of interconnected sonnets, a very difficult form to write in. And then The Unattached Male, her latest production, last two years ago. She has, in addition to producing five full-length books, produced four chapbooks, Aesop's Eagles and Poems from the Road, as long ago as 2001, Up from the Root Cellar, and Herding, and then her last from which she's going to read tonight. Her last production is called The Last Gun. Delightful book. She's also, I mean, part of her newest manuscript is a, a long persona poem called, well, I don't know what it's called, but it's about a woman named Hannah. Is it called Hannah? Hannah Alive. Hannah Alive. And she, um, she was, that poem was produced, performed by an actress professional actress in Washington last fall, and another and another professional actress in Chicago has asked permission to perform it there, so, I mean, what the heck. <laughs> so, um, she also has, she has two sons, both of whom are professional soccer players. They've played for America, they've done all manner of, of um, kind of public talk about soccer. Her son Greg, her younger son Greg, is the, I forget whether executive or managing editor of, which is it? Editor-in-chief. Oh, <laughs> editor-in-chief of the, um, of MLS.com, which is the major league soccer organization. And he's in New York City doing that. And her other son is uh, Alexi Lawis, who is the redhead you will have seen, if you have any interest in soccer, commentating on the World Cup, for example. Tall, red-headed lad. Wonderful. So, I'm going to read you a poem. It was the first poem I heard Anne, I, of Anne's that I heard back in a workshop in the early 90s in Washington. It's about Alexi, and it's called Raisin Bran Man, Raisin Bran Man. In the morning, I pour Kellogg's into a bowl, add milk, look at the box. My God, what's Alexi doing there? This Raisin Bran Man kicking elbow high a soccer ball. Who is this motherless one? whose autograph is mine for a box top, whose barcode was read at the checkout. Bran, good for the aging, and seed-filled raisins. Give me that sweet hope of sun and remembrance of what things were like before breakfast. So I give you Anne, who's not going to read that poem, Anne Harding Woodward. Thank you, Nan. <laughs> Thanks for sparing me some of the things you might have told. <laughs> I'll do it personally. <laughs> um, it's great to be here. It's wonderful to be part of the um, Guildford Poetry Guild again after all these years. And you're in a new space. This is a wonderful place for poetry. Thank you to the library for that. I thought tonight I would um, have bookends with my with a poem, for, two poems from uh, this little chapbook called Herding. These are my cow poems. 
And I'm going to start with um, a poem called My Cow. And it's, this is a Holstein, and the one I'm going to read is about a Guernsey. We live, um, or up until a few months ago, we lived right across the street from the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. And so I would walk uh, up to the Bishop's Garden at the cathedral very often. It's a beautiful walk, a beautiful place to go. My cow. If dogs were cows, there'd be a Guernsey on my bed. I'd rub her ears and her head would slant into my touch. If I said something like, want to go for a walk? She'd jump down and race to the door, and her haunches would shake with excitement. I'd attach a lead to the ring in her nose, and we'd walk to the cathedral, her switch pendulous, gracefully coiling, anticipating insects, and projecting an eagerness to find other cows in the bishop's garden, where they'd munch hyssop and Elijah blue fescue. And when the bishop came into the garden, he'd stay his hands high, in a pontifical way, and bless even the lowliest among us. But my cow would know she was not lowlier than the bishop, and through her nose, her throat, her thick brown and white neck, she'd bay a word so booming that the non-cow creatures would look at her, some with scorn, some with fright, while all the other cows would smile their self-containment. Well, Nancy mentioned that I'm in several um, singing groups. Music is very important to me, and I do sing a lot. Uh, and I manage to get uh, music into my poems pretty often. I've gotten um, Bach into some poems. I've gotten Berlioz into some poems, and Bob Dylan, and even Joe Crocker, as we will see. Joe Crocker, as we will see. Uh, I'm going to read from the Artemis Sonnets. Um, and this is an experience that a lot of us have had, probably some of you riding along a road late at night when a deer goes out in front of your car. Deer and me, the car's skid is beginning. You and I are the only two left on earth moving toward each other. On the nighttime county road, your hooves on packed snow, my rubber treads on ice. I see your brown fur, you see me. We are staring frozen, locked eye to eye, and I'm going to hit you, you're going to hit me. I am the deer now, I am the hooves on the road, you are the car, the tires, the flare of lights. I'm going to kill you, you're going to kill me. I'm killing and breaking and sliding and skidding inside this steamed up glass and metal while Joe Cocker is singing, you are so beautiful to me. <laughs> As a child, some of you might remember the um, Amal and the Night Visitors, which used to be shown on NBC. It was commissioned by NBC of John Carlo Minotti uh, in 1951. And the original Amal was a young boy named uh, Chet Allen, a boy soprano. And he never sang another role after that. He suffered from depression as he got older, and he ended up in Columbus, Ohio, uh, working in a grocery store until the day that he took his own life. This is called The First Amal for Chet Allen, 1939 to 1984. You became a man with a changed voice, Boy soprano turned grocer's aid. You shelved peas and tuna fish and flattened empty cartons that shouted which end up, imperatives of fragility. You sprayed asparagus alive, swept sweet sawdust. Tunes hummed a tremolo of sheep. 
and darkness locked the space around you. So did you limp home, thinking of the pills you planned to swallow, your throat aching to reach a high A, to tell of the brightest kinds of things in the perfect night sky. You'll remember that Amal would limp to the door and look out and see the star that was going to bring the wise men to the, the manger. And that poem is typical, a typical example of my interest in the mind, in writing about mental instability. I get into fear, insomnia, personality disorders, obviously sometimes suicide, and sometimes murder. Um, here's an example of a poem that um, this shows what I mean. Um, outside of D.C., there's a beautiful concert hall called Strathmore Hall, where the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra plays. And one day, one night, I went to a concert there where uh, there was a screen high over the orchestra, and it projected Psycho, while the orchestra play, played that amazing soundtrack. And if you remember the soundtrack from from your your youth. Uh, it's heavily into strings, and, and the strings get higher and higher, and they just almost screech. And you just can't forget it. On seeing Psycho in a concert hall, the orchestra begins to play. The screen, out of certain bravery, hangs high in the hall. We all know what's going to happen, because memory is swirling in this place tonight, reaching back to when it felt good to tremble. Back to drive-ins, reruns, rainy nights, and sleepovers. And the music, the strings, you know they're going to climb higher and higher until they squeak, screech, cricket shrill into your body, and you hear and see, absorbed into your past, into the bygone night of a film that's risen again from a dead man's mind, into a steamy shower, into murder, and blood and water in the drain. When it stops, it does not stop. Even the musicians crane their necks, believing in the sounds they've made, turning their eyes up to the screen to take in, like us, what they've been accomplices to. Another similar poem that gets into the mind is when I saw a beautiful photograph of a street in Oslo done by, taken by um, an artist who had just been to a James Taylor concert in Oslo. And then he posted it online. I saw this photograph. James Taylor has that song, uh, uh, um, when you're down in trouble, or when you need a, yeah, uh, when you need a friend, or something. I forget the title. You've got a friend. You've got a friend, right? Yeah. Artists Blue Hour, Oslo. The photo was just all blue. The street was covered with um, snow. There had obviously been a heavy snowstorm, and it was the whole photograph was blue. Artists Blue Hour, Oslo. I've seen the photo you took yesterday at dusk the all blue of your street. You're on your way to a place, but where? The store, the stuba, the studio? Blue needs supply, needs eye, needs easel. Blue needs brush, needs nod, needs song like when you're down and troubled. Gesture annuls crisp air, the way clouds turn sun blue over blue over sapphire on snow. That's when you need a helping hand. At the blue hour, the down and troubled hour, I can tell you're going toward amethyst, something to warm your red chapped hands. Those two poems, Psycho and the Blue Hour, um, are part of a collection that I'm putting together. Um, I'm, the working title for it is Numb which I, take, I took from Emily Dickinson's poem, I Felt a 
funeral in my brain. It's a beautiful poem. And the second stanza says, and when they all were seated, a service like a drum kept beating, beating, till I thought my mind was going numb. So that's why I'm calling this manuscript numb. I think Emily Dickinson really understood the fragility of the mind. Here are a few poems from Numb. This is what I call a sign poem. I go around taking pictures of signs, and um, then I use them as the titles of my poem. So this poem is called Fragile Roof. I found this sign in England um, on, on a roof of an abandoned building that wanted you to stay off the roof. Fragile Roof. Were I to climb up there, could I walk on such fragility? I see whole lath that's fallen, trusses that do not truss. Do I have the means at all to walk on high? Or should I lie here on a solid floor and look up through decay into naked trees and more clouds gray and full of thunder? Secure I am enfolded here and curious too, but doubtful that the roof will hold. This poem is called Insomnia, and it's written in three different sections. And each section has a slightly different style to it. Insomnia. May I have your attention, please? The library will be closed in 10 minutes at 8 o'clock. The library will be closed. Nope. Yeah. Nope, you bet. We're good until 9. Read fast. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Insomnia. Soundless comes at night streaming on cobwebs from rafters or across floorboards and under the bed. It never learned a language, though it quivers. It never learned to moan in a throat, never learned to stomp on stairs or pound a fist against glass. It can look through its own transparency, mere mine. It signs with finger, fingers that remain unheard. Fiery mica hides in surrounding rock the early side of day. Middle night, the walls do not move. The stairs rise silent and fall. Not a paw twitches. Not a light switch clicks. The fish settle to lower inches beside the castle. Still, I hear the humming of my blood. It throbs, ebbs, swarms through my arms, to my shoulders, to my toes, in and out of the heart of me, pulsing hydrozoa, animal, insect, a clock set for 6.30, tarsal claws, sturdy splayed on the dresser. A spider, intruder of the secret kind, as we lay separate in our bed two nights ago, bit my arm. By morning, at my wrist, a mound grew hot, angry, deep, and red. A flame will always die, but leave a shadow of itself. Later, in our morning sun, I smoothed the bed. A blur of black swept across a pillowcase. Between a tissue ready in my hand, I tracked it to its crunching end. And yet last night, as we lay side by side, I knew it wasn't gone. There was a skittering beneath the sheet a tingling on my toes, up and over both my thighs, a presence I knew I had to keep from you and me. And when the swelling on my arm began to itch, I also knew the presence had a name. And so I scratched and scratched some more, in rhythms rub, as if a song would keep us safe from what was with us there. Nancy mentioned I, I did. Li I lived in Greece, and um, this poem is about the evil eye. The whole concept is that you 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 you, you, you might wear an evil eye to keep the evil eye off of you, that like repels like. Um, and for babies in Greece in those days, this was the early seventies. I don't know if um, it still happens in Greece. But you put a, an evil eye pin on the back of a baby's shirt 
to keep any evil eye off of him and her. And it's back there so that he can't grab it with his hands and her hands. Also, no one knows who has the evil eye. And just because you carry it doesn't mean you're a bad person, but you just don't want to put it onto somebody else. Evil eye in Psihiko, Athens, 1973. The infant sleeps, flushed, white blanket, the park sun heated to dusty green, azure eye pinned to his shirt, in back so his hands can't grab it. I am the mother, sitting new and pushing the stroller. Pull back, push forth. The bench is rough, and I will ward off an eye because they say, like repels like. I to evil eye. To call her who approaches Yaya is done. She is not mine. She wears black, muslin, pull back while she admires the baby. Push forth. Ah, such a child. Joy, oh my joy, she says. Pull back. Push forth. I am the mother, full and young of fear. His pin may not suffice. She may carry harm. No one knows for sure. Push forth, even she, once the mother, pull back, she knows the fear of herself. She spits three times, spits a thrice rapid saliva salvo into the clay earth. Three times she spits to reassure me. Three times she smiles through dark eyes and spits. I am the mother, I see her teeth. So spitting three times is gonna make sure that uh, if she has the evil eye, the child won't be harmed. So here's another um, poem from my um, experience of living in Greece. This is the um, reminiscence of a man I knew who had lived through the war as a child and um, during the occupation, the Nazi occupation of Athens. And um, after the war, have your attention, please. The library will be closing in five minutes. <laughs> he was given a, uh, after the war, he was given a toy gun, and turned out that somebody else wanted that gun. After, the war, after war, the toy gun. A deserting wife bundled her infant, moved through occupied Athens after curfew, and defied the German gunshot meant for anything that moved. Out of war, suspicion infiltrates the heart of some, even of the youngest victims, and stays long after war is over. But this child grew without suspicion into the years after the occupiers had left. He played soldier on warm afternoons in the street, usually with a stick for a gun, until the day his mother gave him a new toy pistol. He was playing with it when a stranger appeared from behind the kiosk. Beautiful gun, the stranger said. May I borrow it to show my son? The mother observed from the apartment balcony as her child handed the gun to the stranger. She did not call out to him a mother's warning, and for many days after that, she watched him as he waited. He showed no suspicion, waited, for the stranger to return with the weapon, which didn't happen. And while we're on the subject of guns, um, I'd like to read a little bit, uh, uh, just one poem from Hannah Alive. This is a series of poems in the voice of a, a woman going on 80, who is worried about that her boys are gonna put her in a nursing home. And she doesn't want to do that. And she thinks a lot about her past. And then later she thinks about the future and what she might do to end her life. And she goes through all kinds of scenarios. Uh, as she, she begins to think about guns. This is called, this doesn't have a name, because none of these do. And I did turn this into a play. As I was writing this, I realized that it was really a play. And so it has become a one-woman play. But I kept the poetry part of it. I kept all the lineation. I've never pulled a trigger. I remember mealtimes through the kitchen window, 
my father would see a goddamn woodchuck in the orchard. Hannah, go get my gun. Out the back door, he'd blow shot into that woodchuck, return and pick up where he'd left off at the table, meatloaf, corn pudding, beets from the garden. How fortunate we are, he'd say, how blessed to have such good food on the table while fur and guts lay in a red pile beside an apple tree. Well, with the gun dialogue that we're having in our country these days, we look at the psychological aspect of gun ownership a lot. I believe very strongly in that the number of guns in our country has to be cut back. In fact, I've let my imagination run wild with me to think that maybe there could be a whole planet without any guns at all. So, um, but before I do that, let me read um, one more. Let's see. I, to, to, to figure out how I got this whole, um, the, the, the journey that I've been on in thinking about the gun in America today, um, I think there are two things that have influenced me. One was the um, death of a boy that I knew. Uh, he killed himself with his father's gun purely by accident. And I'm going to read a poem called Charlie C. Charlie taught me how to pick up snakes and shot himself with his father's gun. Black and yellow, tail tip in a boy's hand, a snake moves. A snake moves like the extra length of arm of a Turkish puppet, desperate and afraid, captive, and tries upwards to sink itself into child flesh, make a noise of hiss gargled in a red throat. Charlie kept his snakes in the garage, all spirals, braided, unlit medusa bonnets. He talked for them in their boxed-in circles, fed crickets to these things that nobody loved up to the moment he found his father's loaded gun and died. The second thing that I think has influenced me is um, Emily Dickinson's beautiful poem, My Life Had Stood a Loaded Gun. And this is, is also a persona poem in the voice of a gun that says uh, at the end, for I have but the power to kill without the power to die. And unbeknownst to me, I wrote The Last Gun in the voice of The Last Gun on Earth. And uh, I didn't realize I had been it until I went back to this poem later. And I said, that's where it all started. Um, anyway, The Last Gun is um, The Last Gun on Earth. And to just set the stage a little bit, um, all the guns in, in the world have been collected except for one. It's arrested. He, he awaits trial. He's tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. Now, on the front of this little chapbook that's just come out is Anubis, the Egyptian, Egyptian god of embalmment and afterlife. Um, and I think you'll see the connection in a little in a bit. He represents ancient Egypt, a civilization that's gone. And I just hope the gun is going to disappear, too. Of course, if the gun were to disappear, there'd be a lot of nostalgia. But the loss of certain things, even whole civilizations, isn't all that bad. What's it like to be the last one? Lonely, of course, at least on the inside. I am empty. I never get a chance to go off or to express myself the way I used to. Time was when they marveled at my hair trigger volatility, but that was just exuberance that came when I was in someone's hands or when I was being aimed in a particular direction. Sometimes I get mail, pretty often in fact. There are still lots of guys out there who don't like what's happened to me or to all of us, and they send me postcards with pictures of GIs and deer lying on fenders, cop jokes, Al Capone, Wayne LaPierre, one guy sent me a cake with a bullet in it, a bullet made of chocolate which melted when a guard tried to load me up. He was drunk, thought he was being hilarious. It felt good to have something thrust into me like that, brought back memories. 
There's a lot of longing right now, a lot of remembering and wishing. Clubs, ranges, whole seasons have shut down. Guys don't know what to do with themselves anymore, so they make cakes. Pussies. Gun in solitary. I lie idle now. My joints need oil. I'm locked in a small cell 24 hours a day. There's nothing but void. Not even a butcher knife keeps me company. Solitary confinement is just like the loneliness of abundance. Vacancy, the emptiness of any once rich and now dried up civilization. But what do I care about civilization? I never did, and I don't now. I don't care about anything. I see pictures in my mind. I kill children, and I put on my archaic smile, slowly, almost as if I will burst into song. Then I see children smiling back at me with bright lights behind them, and I hear sounds of a wind chime made of bullet bling that once hung from pretty ears. In lieu of flowers, send money to them. You know, the ones who think it's the person, not the gun, the crazy person in particular. How do you think that makes me feel? I'll tell you, second rate, even less smart than I thought I was, inferior to all human beings, which of course I'm not. I kill human beings, but they've got to say it's the person, even if they don't believe it. That's the way they work. I don't mean to badmouth them. I love them, man. But they can't save me now. It's over. They're going to be out of a job. Send them a couple of bucks, will you? You know, when I'm gone. Mm -hmm. This um, little chapbook is when Anubis, the god of embalmment, speaks. He says what he will do with this gun. I will embalm the gun dip it in antimony, salts, and mercury to preserve the image of a life that is no more. I will detach grip and trigger. Both have fingerprints that cannot be erased thoroughly. But I will try before I reattach the parts to the body. History must be able to interpret design and intention centuries from now. I will hook the bullet, pull it through the barrel nose, steep it in formaldehyde, and return it to its chamber. History must be able to decipher the bullet's use as the empowering heart of a cherished anatomy. I will wrap the gun in linen strips, brush them with sweet resin to conceal the stench of death, and I will place tokens within the wrappings, a sword, a toy, a raven, a rose, a razor blade. This is my duty, to prepare a thing for the journey across the river, where it will be judged for its deeds on earth. So now, for the other bookend, a cow poem. There's my very cows. Um, you know, the, uh, the ancient Egyptian civilization disappeared, and a lot of empires have disappeared, the Roman Empire in particular, and Nancy mentioned Fred's interest in the Roman Empire. Um, we've gone to many different parts of the world, to, to the North Africa as well as Europe, to see where the Roman Empire spread its claws. And um, I'm going to end with a poem called Looking for a Roman Hill Fort in the Cotswolds. It should be up there. Where? There, where those cows are. It should be there. Where? There. See the grassy rise? Where? There, where the green earth heaves. You see it, I know you do. How do you know what I see? And the barracks, the towers, the fosse, they're all there. The first defense, the legionnaires, see? I guess I see what might have been a foss if it's where the green earth dips. Over there, near those cows. That's it. And the walls. Walls? The uh, inner walls. Inner walls? Where? Over there. I know you see them. We see the same thing. 
How do you know we see the same thing? I see some cows on a green plain. Yes, but you have to look beyond cows to see anything. Around them, under them, beneath them, beneath the ground they trample. Thank you very much.